Introducing YouTube Memberships, a fun way to support the channel while getting some exclusive perks. Click the join button to become a member now and get benefits like badges next to your name on videos, behind the scenes photos, advantages during the live trivia game, discounts on merchandise, private one-on-one -on -one video chats, the ability to request future video topics, and exclusive 8-10 to 10 minute videos on the history of the NFL. And now, on with our feature presentation. Before I start, I just want to say that yes, I saw what happened at the end of the first half in the Giants-Bills game. Yeah, that was one of the stupidest things I've ever seen. However, Brian Dable did not call the play there. In fact, he was furious that his quarterback audibled into that play. That was never supposed to happen. I want to wait until we get some more quotes and understand some more about the situation before I decide what the heck to do content-wise about that play. But by the definition of the series, it was not a dumb decision. Players going rogue is not a dumb decision. So there might be something on that play in the near future, but it won't be a dumb decisions episode. I haven't decided what to do about that. I'm still trying to process whatever the heck just happened. Now, let's talk about this game. October 15th, 2023. It's week six of the NFL season, and we've got an interconference battle on our hands between the Philadelphia Eagles and the New York Jets over at MetLife Stadium. For the Eagles, as in the main subject of our story today, this is a pretty big game for them. Earlier in the day, the San Francisco 49ers, in rather stunning fashion, lost to the Cleveland Browns, meaning that the Eagles enter this game as the only undefeated team in football as the number one seed in the conference. If you win this game, not only do you get a bit of cushion on top of the NFC East, with a chance to really be out in front through six, depending on what the Cowboys do in their game on Monday night, but you put yourself in a prime position to get the number one seed for the second straight year, a third of the way through the season, and potentially have the postseason run through Lincoln Financial Field, which is obviously a pretty big deal. And you've got a good chance to win this game on paper, you're playing the New York Jets, a team with Zach Wilson at quarterback, a team that not many people are giving a chance at winning, and a team that, quite literally, has never beaten the Eagles. Seriously, ever since the teams first met in 1973, every meeting has been won by Philly, and you can learn more about one of those meetings by clicking the card in the upper right corner. You should be able to do this. However, through the first 58 minutes of the game, there was both good and bad news for Philly. The bad news was that it was pretty tough. The ground game hadn't gotten much of anything going. DeAndre Swift, who has been a lock to pick up 100 yards in practically every game in the past month, is held to just 18. Jalen Hurts, one of the top quarterbacks in football, has thrown two interceptions. After scoring 14 points on the first three drives of the game, your last five drives have resulted in a fumble, a punt, a punt, an interception, and a missed field goal. For an offense that has a tendency to move the ball effortlessly down the field, against this vaunted Jets defense, it's not so easy. The good news, though, is that you're still winning this game. In fact, you're up 14-12 with two minutes left, and with the Jets having no timeouts available at their disposal. Facing 39, Barring anything crazy, with the way your defense is playing, and with the Jets being highly ineffective at moving the football like they've been for most of the season with Zach Wilson under center, if you're this man right here, head coach Nick Sirianni, you should be good. You should be able to improve to 6-0. Just don't do anything stupid here, and you're fine. So let's see what play the Eagles have lined up coming out of the two-minute warning. Alright, I like it. Spread out the Jets and force them to not stack the box by lining four out wide. And then, hand the ball off so they can run out the clock and pin them deep with the punt. This is a really smart call. Hurts. Oh my god, they're throwing it. Oh my god, they're throwing it. But, but, but why? There's like one scenario where this works, and about 99 where it doesn't. Against this Jets defense? With Zach Wilson on the other side? Knowing the clock could stop? Knowing you could throw an interception like has already happened twice? Eagles, man! Do you want to stay undefeated? Why are you throwing the football? 
Why are you throwing the football? Facing a four-man rush over the middle. It's intercepted. Picked off by Tony Adams. Adams on the run. Breaking tackles. Welcome to Dumb Decisions. Before I break down what happened here, this whole series is about taking an in-depth look at decisions made during games that were clearly awful from the start. This isn't something to look bad in hindsight. Rather, this is something to look awful almost immediately. These are moves where your gut instinct tells you right away that there is no way this can possibly work. And sure enough, your gut instinct was smarter than that of an NFL head coach. And for this one, we're taking a look at the mind of Philadelphia Eagles head coach Nick Sirianni. I've got to say, I'm surprised Sirianni is making an appearance on this show. Most of the coaches that have appeared this season are either bad, are coaching god-awful teams, or have fallen off hard compared to where they used to be. But Nick Sirianni? I gotta be honest, in a season of dumb decisions, this is like when the teacher's pet doesn't do their homework. Et tu, Nick? You two are falling victim to the stupidity of coaches this season? I'm disappointed, man. I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. Of course, the only way the Jets can finally beat the Eagles for the first time in franchise history is on one of the worst coaching decisions of the season thus far. But I've got to do what I've got to do, because this was just inexcusable on so many levels. So with that being said, let's take a look at why calling a passing play here on 39 with two minutes left in the game is a really bad idea. As always, I like to look at the risk and reward of calling a play in a given spot. And here? Oh man, the risk did not outweigh the reward. Not in the slightest bit. I know you're gonna say, but wait a second. I thought you always said that if the reward for a play succeeding is that you win the game right then and there, then you do it. And that's not a dumb decision. Why are you being so hypocritical? And that is true. However, there are limits to that. It's like an onion. There's layers. When the possibility of converting the play is so minuscule as to render that possibility an impossibility, no, that does not apply. If you have 4th and 21 and you're winning and the other team has no timeouts and there are 50 seconds left, yes, going for it and converting ensures that you win the game. But that doesn't mean you do it. And based on what we're about to dissect here, it was not worth it at all. Let's say you do what just about everyone would have done in that situation and that is to hand the ball off. The smart thing. Call a draw play with DeAndre Swift or something, have receivers set up out wide so as to possibly fool the Jets into thinking you're throwing, and loosening up the box a bit, and then give it to Swift. No, the odds are not high that you pick up the first down. You could, but that's not the point of this play. The point is that you churn a clock. You call the play at the two-minute mark. The play takes five seconds, and then... You take 40 seconds off the clock. This means that you're punting it back to the Jets with 115 left. And if we assume a punt takes 7 seconds, and since you'd be punting this ball near midfield, this means that the Jets have 108 left to mount a drive with no timeouts available at their disposal that is likely starting at the 10-yard line. No, you don't win the game with a running play here right then and there. But it's highly likely that you do. Let's think about this. The Jets would be getting it back at their own 10-yard line with 108. Your defense has been absolutely balling, and that's having to defend the full field and the full playbook. Now, the Jets can't really check it down or use the middle because time is of the essence. Greg Zerline is the Jets kicker, and he can realistically hit anything from 60 yards out. So that's the 42-yard line. This means that, in order for the Jets to have a shot at winning, they have to drive about 50 yards in one minute with no timeouts. Let's just call it for what it is. They're probably not going to do that. I mean, they could, but it would take a lot. Over the Jets' previous three drives, they picked up 19 yards. They called 18 plays and got 19 yards. For the vast majority of the second half, They've averaged barely over one yard per play. They can't run the ball with 108 left. Zach Wilson has just 155 net passing yards on the day. And on the Jets' last 21 plays, 
want to know how many yards they picked up? 14. Seriously, 14 yards on the last 21 plays. Going back to the middle of their fourth most recent drive, they've averaged less than a yard per play. And if you run the ball here on this third and nine, you're telling Zach Wilson, okay, kid, drive 50 yards to give yourself a chance to get a field goal and do it while having just one dimension to the offense and do it while having no timeouts. I'm not saying it's a guarantee they're going to win the game, but seriously, raise your hand if you have any faith that the Jets offense can do that. Anyone? Seriously, anyone? Do you really believe, Coach Sirianni, that Zach Wilson, who on the last 12 passing attempts has been sacked twice and has netted just 26 yards, could possibly pull this off? Do you really believe that the Jets offense, which has been stalled all day, and now you take away the only thing working, which was Brees Hall in the running game or the checkdown game, could pull this off? Come on. Again, I don't want to say that it's a 100% stone cold lock that you win the game if you punt it away and run the clock down to a minute. Crazy things have happened. But barring something insane, you pretty much win the game. And that takes us to the alternative, which is, well, whatever the heck happened. Too much can go wrong if you throw a pass here, especially since Jalen Hurts has had a terrible game thus far, throwing multiple interceptions and being given fits all day by this incredible Jets defense. Sure, the pass could be completed and you could win the game, but it could also fall incomplete. And now, the Jets are getting it back with about 1.45 left at a timeout. And time isn't a huge issue for them and they can open up their playbook in a way more manageable spot. They have about eight more plays to work with if you do this and it's incomplete. The pass could be intercepted, and at that point, you've lost the game because now they're in field goal range already. And it's not like you played the hot hand and it backfired. Your offense had been terrible. The last five drives before this, you hadn't gotten any points. Heck, one of those five drives ended with a pick and another one of them ended with a turnover. If you have two options, and one of them involves trusting the Jets' offense to make multiple plays in succession with their backs against the wall and with half their playbook to work with, and the other one involves trusting the Jets' defense to make one singular play, I know which one from the Eagles that I'm choosing. And I'll give you a hint, it's not the one that the Eagles ended up doing. After the game, Nick Sirianni spoke about the decision to throw the ball in that third and nine. And he, surprisingly enough, had no regrets and learned absolutely nothing from this. Said Sirianni, We thought that if we got the first down there, in that particular case, the game was over. The worst thing that could happen, happened. Sure, every time you're going to think about it. I don't think in that particular case, we thought running it was the right thing. Then... We got a third down earlier in that drive that we converted on in similar circumstances. We're going to trust our guys to make plays. And look, I completely understand the idea of you need one first down to end the game, and we trust our players. But by that logic, why not trust your defense to make a play? If you throw the ball and get it, yes, your odds of winning are 100%. But if you don't get it, your odds drop significantly either by turning it over and giving them the ball in field goal range already, or by giving them tons of time on the clock with a timeout in their back pocket. Meanwhile, if you run the ball, no, you're probably not going to get it. But your odds of winning are probably in the 98% ballpark. It's almost like the golfer who is up by three strokes on his opponent on the final hole and goes directly for the green over a giant body of water instead of laying it up and going around. Sure, if you get the green right then and there, you're guaranteed the win. But if you don't, that's a catastrophe. Nine yards against this Jets defense in one play that had already forced your quarterback to throw multiple interceptions, or having Zach Wilson drive 50 yards in a minute with no timeouts when your defense has been bowling. And again, that's just for the Jets to be on the outermost fringe of field goal range. If you honestly thought that throwing the ball there gave you the best chance, I don't know what to tell you, man. I honestly don't. It was a gross miscalculation of the flow of the game. That's all I'll say. And look, 
I'm not saying that all throws on 39 in a situation like that are a bad call and a dumb decision. Context is everything. If you're in a shootout and your quarterback has been playing lights out, it's a lot different. If Patrick Mahomes is on the other side, as in a guy that even if you run it and punt it back to them, you know can drive down the field in no time at all and can pick up that yardage in two plays, it's a lot different. If you've allowed a touchdown on your last four drives and the odds are extremely high that your defense will not be able to get a stop if they give it back, it's a lot different. But this, this situation, with the way your defense is playing and with who is the quarterback on the other side of the equation? Come on, man. This was just a really bad week for coaching in the NFL across the board. It started on Thursday with the Broncos Chiefs game when Sean Payton just decided to call a timeout at the end of the first half for some reason, thereby giving the Chiefs three free points. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And things did not get any better on Sunday. You have a Commanders-Falcons game, where Arthur Smith just completely bungled the final five minutes in terms of an in-game management standpoint. You have whatever the heck happened in Giants-Bills. I'm still trying to figure that out, who is responsible and whatnot for just about everything in that one. You had jaguars Colts where the Jags were up by 14 points with two minutes left. They had the game wrapped up and decided to put their franchise quarterback in jeopardy with a banged up offensive line by calling a naked bootleg. And then you had, well, whatever the heck happened in this scheme behind it right here between the Jets and the Eagles. The only reason that there are no undefeated teams left in the NFL right now is because Nick Sirianni lost his ever-loving mind. Seriously, I don't know what he was thinking but it was not the right call. Not at all. So what do we learn from all of this? Just because you can win the game right then and there, doesn't mean that trying to win the game right then and there is always your best play. Your biggest friend when you're ahead is the clock, so use that to your advantage. If the best case scenario in both option A and option B are exactly the same, even if option B gives you a significantly less chance of getting that best case scenario to happen, but option A failing means that it's going to be an uphill climb to win the game, and option B means you've still got a 98% chance of winning, then take the second option. And understanding the flow of the game is absolutely critical in moments like this, because that's what costs Nick Sirianni here big time. Because when all of these elements are in play, you can't exactly be surprised when this play backfires. Talk about a dumb decision. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.